Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. We'll get to today's episode, but first, a thanks to our sponsors, The Art of Leadership Academy and Belay. If you've ever thought you need more people in your corner, you've got to check out The Art of Leadership Academy. In it, you'll find a network of over 1,300 top church leaders from across the country and around the world in your corner who are ready to coach you. And I'm there to coach you too. All my premium content, monthly team training, and so much more inside the Academy. And it's all for less than the price of a conference, a course, or anything else you could possibly find. Check it out at theartofleadershipacademy.com. And again and again, I run into leaders who don't know who to hire and can't find the right people. That's where Belay provides such value. They'll do a free 20-minute consultation with you. I turn to Belay again and again for staffing, and they are the staffing solution I trust. So to book your free staffing solution, go to belaysolutions.com slash carry, and you'll get a 20-minute session to help you figure out what you need. And at the end of today's podcast, they'll give you some free tips on how to delegate to an expert from Belay. So make sure you watch for that. Check it out. And now to today's episode. Rich, welcome back. It's good to have you. Man, so good to be here, Carrie. I uh, just love your show, love everything you're doing, and it's honored to be here, honored to, to sit down and have a chat for a bit. Well, apart from living 10 minutes from each other, we get to do a lot together at our church and behind the scenes. Mm. And every once in a while, I'm like, right, this has to surface. We need to have another public conversation because you've sure. just taught me so much about leadership, ministry, future trends, all that stuff over the years. So let's let some people over here. Uh, I think we're in new territory as church leaders. Mm. So I'd love for you to go back, rewind three or four years, and just talk about how much things have changed. What are some of the significant shifts that you're seeing over the last few years in leadership and ministry and the church? What are you seeing? That's a great question. You know, I and it's kind of the question of the day, right? What's changed? You know, we're... I don't know where we are kind of in relation to COVID, post-COVID, whatever that is. Where I heard someone the other day actually refer to this as a pandemic era, which I was like, they're like, well, we're in a living in a pandemic era. And I was like, that's a very strange term. I don't know that I want to live in a pandemic era. But no, yeah, doesn't it depend on what state you live in, whether you're in a pandemic or yes, not? Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think it does. So true. That's it so depends true. how you voted, whether you're actually in a pandemic or not in a pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, there's no doubt, I think, you know, when we look back over these last few years, there's definitely been shifts. I think the thing I keep hearing, one, you know, you hear these stories from church leaders and you're like, oh, that's related to that's related to that. It's like you hear these stories over and over. And, you know, one of them, I, I think, is this is really this increased perception of social isolation. I think there's a, whether it's more awareness of it or whether it's actual, there's this idea of like people are more isolated from each other before. I've heard from multiple churches that are talking about in their kind of volunteer onboarding process that like in 2018, 2019, they would have, you know, 30 people sign up for a newcomer's class and they would have 25 people actually show up to that. But now hmm. they'll they'll have 30 people sign, sign up and 15 will actually show up. Like it's, it's, it's a marked difference. And, you know, there's like a, there's more kind of um, just even this week, I was I was in a small group situation, and we were talking about a friend who came to church who's kind of like in our orbit, has done stuff online with our church, and they, they showed up for the first time, and they hadn't come to, so they're like coming to the in-person service for the first time. And uh, this person that was showing up for the first time, they saw this friend of mine who uh, get out of their car and then they jumped out of their car and then basically attached themselves to the side of this person and was like, Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Like, can you help me through this experience? And, you know, I, I just, I haven't been in person before. And, and, you know, which is fascinating because I was like, that person, aren't they really involved here? And they're like, well, no, it's just all online. It's never been in person. And so there's this idea of isolation that I think has impacted some of our social norms, right? How we just interact with each other. I think we see that time and again, um, which has led to the other thing I've, I see a lot is this whole idea of loose loose ties, like social networks. They talk about the people that are like, not social networks in like online social networks, but like the, if you were to plot out this your social relationships, that there's the people who are like three people removed or four people removed from you, loose ties. So it's like mm -hmm. friends of friends of friends. Um 
there, there is some evidence that there's actually a reduction in those connections that people, because their, your core group is a bit smaller. Well, then all those people that are out there in that outer orbit, there's, you have way less of those people because of the exponential relation way that relationships work. And the problem with that is from a church point of view is that's often where growth comes from. Those are the people that we're inviting to church. It's not necessarily because you've already invited everyone that I know I've invited. I've invited all my family. I've invited. And then, and then I, you start to meet people who are farther out. Well, if there are, if you have less people in that loose ties layer, man, then, then it's, it's going to be harder for you to actually just contemplate who would I invite? Who are the people that I would invite to come to, to my church? And so from, and we know that churches grow by people inviting their friends. And so I think that particularly is one of those, it's kind of a, it's connected to this social isolation piece. Yeah. So there's like a million things going on in my brain right now. So let me try to, cause, <laughs> cause you always have such good observation. I wonder, and I mean, feel free to disagree. I wonder if as a culture, we've gotten to the point where it's easier to just claim permission to opt out. So your example, Mm. 30 people sign Mm. up, 15 people show up, as opposed to 30 people signing up, 25 people showing up. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was because all of our circuits were broken for a period of months or in some cases a year or longer, Mm. where we really didn't do much other than, you know, forage and eat and (laughs) do the minimum. But social yeah. isolation was was the norm. I wonder whether it is easier now for, like, two things are happening. One, I may say yes, but I'll opt out. I'm not saying that's mm-hmm. a good thing, but I wonder if mm-hmm. there's less shame around it, less... Because, mm-hmm. I mean, how many times over the, those two years during the pandemic did we have plans? We're all going to get together for mm-hmm. Thanksgiving. We're all going to, and then it's like, oh, mm-hmm. someone got Omicron or somebody got sick. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, cancel, mm-hmm. cancel, cancel. So I wonder mm-hmm. if we've got the hangover of that mm-hmm. in our culture right now. Uh, Chad Veach talked about this on this podcast where he said, you know, if I actually look at my, we'll pick a round number, a thousand, you know, we, we mm-hmm. have a thousand volunteers, but instead of serving every other week, now they're serving once a month sort of mm-hmm. that opt-out thing. It's like, oh, so mm-hmm. now we actually That's need huge. more than a thousand to run this thing. Yep. We need double the number. So sure. I wonder, do you think that's a plausible theory or how do you see it? Yeah, I think that's true. I think there is also, I think pre-COVID, there was a growing sense of um, mental health issues that are, um, you know, there's a general awareness around anxiety, around how do we manage our own expectations? Uh, you know, how do we how do we manage our interior world? And I, I do think that the last few years have have heightened those conversations for a lot of people, where a lot of people are they're thinking about those issues more, and so that is um, led. And it's not it's not a negative thing. I think it's it's just a factor. It's like one of those. It's just the world we live in that people are more willing to create a boundary around. No, I'm not going to over schedule myself. I'm not going to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm going to live at my best and only give green zones to the church. Um, you know, when I only I don't have green zones. I only have a Sunday green zone <laughs> once every four weeks. So I'm not for folks that haven't read Carrie's book. They don't don't understand what we're talking about. But um, but but I I think that's just true. I think. And part of that is anecdotally, just as you talk with people, you're like, and and that's not necessarily all bad. Like there is something mm-hmm. good about creating boundaries or something good about saying, hey, yeah. I, um, you know, I, I, I've given too much. I, I don't want to, I can't do this anymore. Um, but then I, I think that is having an impact, a knock-on effect to what we do. Because particularly in the church, we are our labor force, the people who do what we do, the majority of what is done, at least at healthy churches, is done in people's margins, right? It's done, it's done after work, it's done on weekends, it's it's people giving extra energy at the end of what they do in their normal life, they give us time. And so if people are perceiving that they're running out of energy faster, there, that's where you get, like Chad said, you're going to end up doubling the total number of people that you need uh, to get in, plugged in and connected to, you know, your church. So another theory, plausible theory, is, you know, we got one group, and, and I mean, there are pieces in the New York Times on this recently toward the end of 2022, that are still living in isolation. So there are people who are very afraid right. to yeah. go out, etc. But then there's another group. I'll give you a case study. So we go to the same mm-hmm. church, Connexus Church. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife and I are putting together a small group 
So uh, I thought it was going to be challenging to get this small group together. It is turning out to be impossible and almost, right? Because what we have is we have a whole bunch of people who run things. So a couple of medical doctors, one of them is doing a fellowship. The other has a presidency of a provincial organization. Uh, I have a CEO in the group, uh, a law- couple of lawyers, and, um, and then somebody who does what I do in this space, runs a leadership mm-hmm. company. Mm-hmm. Do you think we can be in town on the same weekend? We want to do Sunday after church for small group. And like, I'm like, okay, we can meet one weekend in 2024. So on the one hand, you had people who were in lockdown, right? Right. Who are now like, okay, we are back on the road. Like you and your Mm -hmm. wife just Mm -hmm. got back from England last week. Mm -hmm. I got back from Florida. So you got a whole Mm -hmm. lot of people who are traveling. And as much Mm -hmm. as we all said a year and a half ago, oh, we're going to do all those meetings by Zoom. No, we're not. Um, You know, so they're, they're back in the air. They're back on the road. So on the one hand, you got people who are hesitant. You've got mm-hmm. people who are opting out. On the other hand, you've got perhaps some higher capacity people who mm-hmm. are like, no, I'm pursuing that fellowship. I'm running that company. I'm taking those speaking engagements. I'm mm-hmm. meeting with my sales manager in LA, Vancouver, Texas, wherever it happens to be. And as a result, they're just not around. Absolutely. You also see that? or Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a, again, there's documented stuff happening around um, you know, kind of the labor force being compressed and, you know, mm-hmm. organizations are stretched. And so you see that on all levels, you know, you see, you know, you used to be a sales, regional sales manager over one region. Now you're like one and a half regions. They gave you a bunch of other people yeah. to manage. Like you hear those kind of stories all the time. And that's, you know, that's related to the economy. That's related to what's happening, you know, in the broader culture. It's not really COVID related. It's just kind of the how what's bubbling up in the, you know, the economy as things continue to move forward. But I think that's the case. And, you know, I think people are trying to, you're seeing that people are out traveling more, they're doing more, they're going on vacations, all that. So for sure, that's, that's a real dynamic that's that's taking place. You know, I think at all levels we're seeing that. Yeah, so we we almost have this like mini nuclear apocalypse of church growth happening right now, right sure. Rich, where sure. you had you had the shutdown of the pandemic, you've got the lingering fear of disease, you got people who won't go out, people who won't commit. Uh, and mm-hmm. then you got people who are in, but they're just not home anymore. Mm-hmm. Sometimes mm-hmm. for legitimate reasons, sometimes not. Uh, and and so you got the point where almost all churches are down at some level. Some have recovered. Um, that's probably still single digit people who are at or past where they were three years ago. And most are in that 70 to 90% ratio. And then a bunch, like I talked to somebody today, 50%. It's like, no, we're still 50% of, of what we used to see. What are you seeing in the realm of church growth? Like you're talking to executive pastors and lead pastors every day. What are you seeing? Yeah, that's that is very true. That's a similar kind of dynamic I hear. I think most people have moved on from, you know, there there was a period where we were all thinking about those numbers a lot, and we were thinking about, okay, where are we? You know, there's a lot. Most churches have said, like, okay, this is our new baseline. We're moving from here. We're trying to figure out how we grow from here. The other interesting thing that's kind of related to that that I keep hearing time and again is. When people do step back and say, yeah, like we're 70, 80% of where we were, um, or we're more than where we were, there there is sure. this common thing of like, I don't know who all these people are. Like there's a bunch of new people. Like there's, yeah. there's I keep hearing that yeah. time and again, that it's like, when I, you know, when I look back, it's like there, it, it, there's like, it's a whole new church that's in front of me. And, and that's a normal dynamic. You know, there's a normal, you know, you're, there's that saying of, you know, you're, you're preaching to, or you're serving a river. It's a stream of people that go by. And it's like, these are the people that are in front of you now you serve them. And then new people shuffle by, and then you serve those people. But there does seem to be something on that front that is accelerating, you know, that is, that's, that's a part of the picture that I keep hearing time and again. You know, I think like pre-pandemic, there are churches who are cultivating an invite culture, who are figuring out how do we, and how do we encourage our people, motivate our people to invite their friends and those churches are doing that. They're figuring that out. Mm. You know, there are some churches that have turtled in this season that, that they've, um, they haven't really thought about the outdoors yet. They haven't thought about other people yet. They're, they're still asking that question. And, um, and you know, I, and I'm, of course there's no one that listens to this podcast that would be in that category. Uh, but no, no, we, no. uh, no, no, of course not. Uh, but you know, we, 
there, we need to continue to encourage those churches to be like, yeah, we need to move on. Like we, there are people outside your doors. It's always been the case. There are more people in your community. Everybody who's listening in, there's more people in your community who don't attend church than attend church for the most part. There's going to be a couple communities where that's not the case, but for the most part, that's true. There's lots of people in your community who need your church. And so how do we help you engage with those people? What can we do to help you get in front of those people? I think it's so critically important. Um, we've got to keep thinking about that strategically and realize that, yes, the culture shifted. Something happened underneath of us. You know, the there there is more, you know, the other factor in this is this kind of acceleration of polarization that we've seen, right? There is, mm-hmm. and that's in all, that's polarization in lots of ways. It's like, you know, politically, all different ways, a socioeconomic, there's way more polarization now, um, which the church has an opportunity to stand in, stand in the middle of that and say, hey, this is the one place where we can be a gathering place. We don't have to be polarized here. We can be the kind of place where people from various backgrounds can be together. We think that's actually what the kingdom of God is all about. And there are, you know, the the thing with polarization is it's being driven by algorithms. It's being driven by the way the media has rolled itself out. It doesn't actually represent middle America or represent the average person. They, they, they don't want to live that kind of life. They want to live more to the center. They want to be connected with other people. And we can be that kind of place. We can be that in a place where people can gather together and say, hey, yeah, I'm not exactly the same as everybody else around, but let's, let's get together and do this thing called church. Uh, I think we can make that happen. Yeah, I love your analogy of it's always been a river, because that's true. You know, when you get somebody new in your church, you think, oh, they're going to stay forever. And occasionally they do, but often they don't. Right. Right. But the river is moving much faster than it ever has before. Mm -hmm. And I think Mm -hmm. you're right. Maybe this is a really good time to take stock and go, all right, wake up. This is our church. There's a bunch Mm -hmm. of new people. Get to know them. Get them engaged. Mm -hmm. Let losses be losses. And let's focus on reaching the city. It's just the river moved a lot faster than we thought. Yeah, and and I think some of that is, if we're honest, if we can all be honest, even, you know, my friends in parts of the country where COVID only impacted you for like three weeks. I love when I run into those people and they're like, COVID, and they're not, that's not a joke. It's like, literally, I was talking to a church leader a couple weeks ago. He was like, we were only closed for three weeks. And that, you know, that's like on the radical minority end of, in the whole thing. And then there's, you know, there's folks like by us where it was like, it, it felt like it was a better part of two years. It was like, wow, we kept mm-hmm. getting closed, which is crazy. Yep. But even those people who were three weeks, you've got to acknowledge that there was a moment there where we all either got distracted, took our, ga- our foot off the gas, looked the other way, we're busy on our phones and we got off mission and, and that's okay. Like that's a part of what, that's a part of what happened. Like don't beat yourself up for that. But now's the time for us to get, we have to get refocused on that. We've got to keep thinking about, okay, you know, what are we going to do? How do we pass this thing on to the next generation? What are we doing to, you know, to reach the people that um, God's calling us to reach? So when you look at the churches that are actually making progress, that are, um, you know, that single digit percentage of churches that are seeing significant growth and perhaps some that have eclipsed where they were before, not that that's the best marker anymore. Mm-hmm. What are they doing? Yeah. So in some ways this is like, yeah, it's, it's, um, so it's not any different than pre-COVID. That's like probably the disappointing part of all this, but, <laughs> you know, growing churches train, equip and motivate their people to be inviters. Like they, they don't mm. leave it up to chance. They don't leave it up to, well, if we do a good job, people will just want to invite their friends. Like, that's just not actually true. Like, if you look at the churches that are impacting the culture, they take time to figure out how do we, yeah, how do we train? How do we equip? How do we motivate consistently? And we may have had to adjust what that looks like in the last few years, but we're still doing that same work. We're still out trying to figure out, okay, how do we encourage our people to talk to their friends? How, what, what tools do we need to put in their hands? How do we talk about what we talk about? How do we position our weekend services? How do we, all of those kinds of things. It's, it's the same fundamental work with, with just maybe some different tweaks as we're, you know, we've learned. Uh, as culture shifts, which again is not, um, this is why I've appreciated you through this whole period, whatever in this pandemic era, we'll call it. Um, you know, I appreciated you because you're saying, hey, really what we're seeing is not anything different than what was expecting, what was happening before. It was just accelerating. It's, it's, and you were the first person that's, a, I know lots of people have said that about COVID. You're the first person that I remember saying that way back, way early saying like, hey, this is, that's really what we're, we're experiencing. The same is true on what is it about our churches that encourages people to attend them. Those things are true. They were true before. They, we have to tweak them and accelerate what we were doing on that front. But 
but it's not like it's a totally new thing. It's not like throw everything out. It, we have to keep working on this, the things that we've, we've done before and we just realize that the culture shifted some. Yeah, I think, you know, crisis to me is a disruptor and mm-hmm. an accelerator. And I think what would have happened over the 2020s, like in other words, we got to 2029, 20, 2030, 2030, mm-hmm. can I say that? That's the first time that's come out of my mouth, so it feels weird. <laughs> anyway, uh, the year 2030. It feels like it feels like what would have happened by then just got here early. Got here in mm. 2021, 2022. Because lots of people reset their lives. Lots of people said, yeah, I'm out. Other people jumped in. And, you know, we saw a decade of decline in a period mm. measurable in months. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that's really, really true. And I think the anticlimactic answer, and I love your answer, and I agree with it, so I'm not pushing back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. It hasn't changed. It's like motivate, equip your people to go invite their friends and, you know, engage in the mission, right? It's engagement, mm-hmm. not just attendance. That's going to drive mm-hmm. future church growth. Mm-hmm. But I run into a lot of leaders. I did a, a live event for a couple thousand leaders this week and, you mm-hmm. know, chat was buzzing and it. And what I heard afterwards and all the DMs were people who said, I can't get my people excited about the mission. Mm-hmm. What, what do you do to get people excited about the mission? Rich. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. I, so there's nothing like telling stories then, you know, that motivates people towards wanting to be involved in what God's up to. You know, it, it, people, I think sometimes as leaders, we're, we're motivated by like the attendance, you know, we're motivated by filled rooms. Like even in this conversation, like we were talking about, like I can guarantee you there's nobody in our church that's like, oh, you know, the fact that we're only 60% of where we were before, like most people, that's like totally blind to them. They're not even thinking and Nobody that. else like, is counting. Like, nobody's going no, around. Nobody's counting. counting. Wait nobody minute, else is counting. Yeah. Years ago, I had a friend of mine said, the only people that like big churches are pastors. And that's true. Like oh. I, that, it actually, the people in our churches, they're not motivated by that. They're not motivated by the fact. In fact, in some ways, a bigger church is worse for them because it means less access mm-hmm. to you as a leader. It means it's harder to get into the parking lot. It means their kids, you got to line up at the kids check-in. Like uh, more people is not actually better for them. And so stories, you know, we have to keep on the stories. And again, this is where it's like foundational. Like it's like back to 101. But we've got to be good at picking out what are those stories that we see happening around us? Who is, where's the life change taking place? And then where are we celebrating that? Where are we taking time to, to talk about that? That's part of why in our, in my tradition, our tradition, that's, you know, this, uh, you know, adult baptism by immersion, I think is such a powerful example. It's, if you can get people to like, get up in front of people, tell something about their story and then get dunked underwater, like that's, what a powerful thing, man. We can't get away from doing that. We got to keep in front of people. We got to keep telling those stories and, and, and really building systems to, to try to generate those stories to be like, we're not just going to, we're not going to leave it to happenstance. Like, no, we're going to find people who need to get baptized, who, who need to get up and tell their story of life transformation, who, who need to get in front of people and say like, Hey, this is an amazing thing. And, and we're going to work on the, like, you know, in a, in a baptism experience, if we, if we do those clump together in one service, like we're going to work on a way that people can get baptized in that moment, that day, if God moves in their life, they like, great, we'll get everything together. And why do we do that? Why do we do all that extra work? Because man, that communicates to people, something's happening, right? Life change is taking place. And that can look different in different traditions. I understand that. You know, our friends, I was like, you were referenced my trip to Alpha or to London last week. I was spending some time at, with our friends at Alpha and at Holy Trinity Brompton. And, you know, it's interesting when you watch any of their materials and that's arguably one of the most effective kind of evangelism tools that there's ever been baked right into their product, right right into their videos are people telling the story of how Alpha has made a difference in their life. They'll be all the time in their videos. They're like, you know, I was in prison and then this guy came and he tells a story about he's in prison. And then, and then this guy showed up and had this thing called Alpha and it made a huge difference. And then he goes on and tells that story. That's literally baked into their core offering. They're, they're saying, hey, we've got to, we've got to make sure that the story is getting told time in, time out. And, you know, that's got to get on your checklist as a leader. You know, you've got to find when those emails that come across your, your inbox uh, that, that are like, hey, this is something cool that happened. 
often I think we wait, those get wasted on us. We're like, wow, that feels amazing. Thank you. But we don't have a place to put those somewhere. We need to have a place where we put those, a box that we put those, maybe not an actual tangible box, uh, a place to put them so that we can share those stories. And I understand that they're, they might be few and precious. Like you may only have three of those stories, but man, let's, let's hold those well. And then, and then find a way to talk about that in, in front of other people. People will get fired up by that in the mission. They'll get fired up when they can, when they can see it, when it's about a person. Um, and then there's obviously then the active engagement part, but I think, you know, the story piece is so critically important. Baptisms are wonderful, but I think you're right. We have to be more expansive than that. Like, uh, sure. I know when I was lead once or twice, and we should have done it a hundred times more, we would do pre-conversion stories. Mm-hmm. Just people mm-hmm. who were totally off church, hadn't made a decision, but they're like, hey, this is a home where I feel comfortable exploring. I think that's a good thing. And I don't know that we're going to cut this out after, but you and I mm-hmm. had uh, something happen in our church earlier this week where mm-hmm. uh, we'll, we'll see if we can talk about this in an appropriate mm-hmm. way. But a 13-year-old mm-hmm. teenager went missing. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was really gripping. I found out about it hours after everybody else did because I'm not technically on staff anymore. But it just showed up on social media. And, you know, it was awful. The good news story, spoiler alert, he was found safe. He simply got lost on a big farm property, saw a bear, got scared, and they found mm-hmm. him in the middle of the night, brought him back to his parents, everybody's safe and sound. So that's good, but we didn't know. And mm-hmm. by dark... I mean, there was a search. The uh, police were there, helicopters, drones. And the word got out on social. I wasn't paying much attention to my phone that day. Mm -hmm. And there were dozens, maybe over 100 Mm -hmm. people from our church who just showed up and started searching. And you were there. I mean, I called Mm -hmm. you. You were my first call. You Mm -hmm. and Chrissy were there at the side of the road Mm -hmm. looking for Maddie. I mean, that was a Mm -hmm. really, really powerful moment. Um, mm-hmm. for our church where they were just overwhelmed by love. Yeah, I, I, I think there's opportunities like that that come along. Um, and my wife is particularly great at this. So <laughs> there's opportunities like that that come along that if we're attuned to saying, hey, this is what the church is actually about. Like, this mm-hmm. is this is the time for us to step in and do something. Like, that actually calls something out of people. Like, it calls, like, mm-hmm. people love it. Like, and... And so, yeah, like we had a few people in our group that we said, we, we said like, Hey, let's, let's go. We, you know, we, cause they're friends. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't, um, pose that as a question. I said, Hey, I would like people to come with me. Uh, you know, you know, will you join me? Let's go, let's jump in the cars. Let's go figure this thing out. Um, and it, you know, all the people who churches say you can't get to engage, uh, showed up at a drop of a hat young men who have oh. jobs that work, you know, they're up at six o'clock in the morning. They're out in the middle of the night searching for some guy. Um, you know, the, people who were having tip can have a difficulty, you know, trying to engage. I, I, a part of it is looking for those opportunities and then looking for ways, not in a, you know, this, this was a legit, we're trying to serve these people. Like oh, yeah. it's, it's a knee jerk reaction. To find a lost kid. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's like, but I, but I do think that there's, there are things like that that come along in our communities that as a church, we have to, our orientation should be towards, hey, how, how does this kind of connect with what God's called our church to do? And are there ways that we can, can serve? And can we, you know, get the, you know, thing I've said in other contexts is get people out of their seats and onto the streets, actually go mm-hmm. do something. And you know what happens, and you've seen it on social this week after that, is man, the church gets a ton of props on that. Like it, it's like Holy people cow. are like the cops you know, were blown away. They're like, who are these? Yes, people? yeah, and that and that is not entirely surprising. Like people in a world that is polarized and is stay at home and you know be on your phone, m- mobilizing, you know whatever, a hundred people to go help with something, um, albeit at the drop of a hat, gets people's attention. You're like, wow, what you know mm-hmm. what happened there? That although that was responding in you know, in a, in a time of need. And it was, it was frankly, because, you know, we've done those kinds of things as churches after hurricanes, after, or not hurricanes, um, what do they call this? After a tornado or, you know, and when there's been those storms and stuff go through, we've done that kind of formally as a church, you kind of bait people into thinking, oh yeah, when those kind of things happen, that's just what the church does. Like we get involved and help. And people love telling the fact that it was folks from their church. That's the part to, to not miss friends. Like what is happening there? That's actually people inviting 
to your church. You're making active inviting invites to your church at that point. I'll be surprised if people don't show up to church this weekend or or if I you know agree. three months from now we hear this story about you know what I'm friends with this family and I saw them talk about this thing and uh, you know and, and you know something happened in my life so then I decided maybe I should go and check out that church. It's different than just let's make an invite card. You know, yeah. which or, or well, like some, you know, thing like that. But and what was so cool about that is it was all organic. Like you can't organize yes. something like that, right? No. Maybe the word got out at four or five o'clock before dinner. Mm-hmm. People started trickling out. It spread on social. There was, I mean, what we were trying to do, what I ended up doing at eleven o'clock at night was getting because Jeff, our lead pastor, was in New York. So I'm working with him on the ground trying to figure out what to do. <laughs> We had to actually harness the efforts of the church because people were doing their own search and that would screw up the dogs, you know, who are just <laughs> sniffing for the latest scent. So I was talking to the police, trying to say, okay, and then talk to one of our senior leaders and said, hey, can you send out a, a note to everybody on social and email? Just mm-hmm. let them know if you're going to help, here's how to help. Like we didn't have to mm-hmm. restrain it, but it was like we had to mm-hmm. guide it a little bit so that it was truly helpful. But, mm-hmm. you know, I got a message from the parents the next day. And it was so heartfelt. I mean, they were they were just over the moon. And they just said, Conexus was love last night. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I think that's the best message I've ever seen in mm-hmm. 25 years of ministry. Yeah, like, that's pretty cool. Like, I was so proud of our church, so proud of Jeff and his leadership, so proud. But those things happen when you seed in that kind of engagement and community right. and right. everything year after year, month after month, decade right. after decade. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, yeah. communities don't mobilize. Right. No, absolutely. And and this is this is a bit of the the secret around the world that the the local church is the greatest volunteer organization in the world. Like y- for years our church in um when I was in New Jersey at Liquid Church, we we were doing uh, water development projects in some of the poorest countries or some of the poorest communities in the world. And we were partnering primarily with an, an organization called Living Water, fantastic organization, Christian organization and and one of their insights is you know, they go into these communities that are less than a dollar a day per person communities. Like these are poor, poor communities. If they don't have access to clean drinking water, it means that nothing else, no other development has happened. Mm -hmm. But they, you know, there's, I was talking to a development officer on the ground and he said, you know, obviously we're a Christian organization. For them, there is, they talk about water and the word. It's like, it's critical for what they do. They do both, you know, both of those things. But he said, you know, even if, even if we weren't here also talking about Jesus, if we just purely were saying, let's let's go from a development point of view, let's what's the best way to go? He's like, even in these communities where it's less than a dollar a day, there are some of the poorest communities in the world, the only organization that's there is the local church. There, the government's not there. There's no nobody else is there because there's no money. There's no like there's no commercials, there's or there's no commerce, there's there's just not, there's nothing else happening but the local church. And so, you know, they go and they work with and partner with the local church in in those communities, which for them is important because of the water and the word piece of their puzzle. But it also is just good development. It's just good. How, how, this is what we're trying to do. We we this is a, a network of people that are already networked together. And this this thing last night or this this week, you know, is an example of that. There was already pre existing networks, right? There's already groups of people who have been who have relationship there's enough people like me out there that have relationship in this case with the the group of young uh parents that's the group we lead who can say in a loving but like direct way guys like this is the moment like we imagined your kid was 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 lost um i would come and do that for you <laughs> Let's go do that for this family. Like you and your and PS, you're not doing anything tonight, anyways. Like you're just watching Netflix. Like you're fine. You're like watching Netflix. Gonna, Come on. It's fine. Like you it's don't need to see fine. the office again. But that's Let's engagement. Go. And and that's when you and mm. I agree the the punch line or the the pithy phrase of like churches of the future are going to be, you know, they're not worrying about attendance, they're worrying about engagement. There's always to me that's like a, a, that and that's true, but what does that actually mean? Like, what is that? And that's an example of one of those things that what engagement means is. We're not just measuring f- the old school kind of factory approach to learning. How many people can we get into this room? How many people How can, can we, we cram le- in an auditorium? Yeah, yeah. let's. Ha- we're not measuring that. What we're measuring is people's level of participation. How are they actually engaging? What are they doing? And so, you know, on an engagement score, sitting in an auditorium gets you 
a certain level of engagement score on a card if you scored it. But let me tell you, you know, getting involved in community service with people from the church, that's a higher level of engagement. You're giving a lot more to make that happen. And if you can do more of that with your people over an extended period of time, uh, they get more plugged in. They're more a part of what happens. They, you know, they become ultimately, like we talked about at the beginning, they become the kind of people that invite folks to their to their church because they they're so a part of it. It's so part of who they are. Well, I think you're so good at that. Like you've really led me in that over the years that we've known each other. But just to underscore this point and to think about the problem we started with from a different angle. Mm-hmm. Last year, I got to spend some time with Rick Warren. I did that legacy mm. exit interview with him, which mm-hmm. is great. And I think mm-hmm. you can still find this on YouTube. I don't think this part I'm going to tell you about made it onto the final cut. But he gave us a tour of uh, Purpose Driven Headquarters and his library, which is on YouTube. If you search me mm-hmm. and Rick Warren, you'll find it. But it was like a two-hour tour. It was crazy, mm-hmm. man. Mm-hmm. And I remember we were stopped in Kay's office, his wife's office. So Rick Warren is a lead pastor of Saddleback, founding pastor of Saddleback. Mm-hmm. Andy Wood's there now. But anyway, long story short, he was talking about the AIDS crisis and the peace plan that they rolled out 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And they were trying to solve the problem of AIDS in the world. And one of the mm-hmm. big issues in the developing world is a uh, distribution system, right? You have corrupt mm-hmm. governments. You mm-hmm. have um, criminals and merchants who just steal mm-hmm. stuff. So you send a plane full of aid to mm-hmm. a developing nation. And like none of it actually reaches the locals right. or 2% reaches the locals. And they were trying mm-hmm. to do like this immunization clinic uh, or whatever mm-hmm. for AIDS. It might not be AIDS, but mm-hmm. anyway, it was, it was a mm-hmm. major global crisis. Mm-hmm. And uh, Rick was meeting with government leaders and he just said, well, I've got the distribution system for you. And they're like, mm-hmm. well... Uh, no, you, you. how do you have the distribution system? Like we can probably roll this out into three cities in the first few years and then maybe 10 a few years right. after that. And he goes, I can, I can be in all the villages in a year. Well, that's mm-hmm. impossible. And he goes, no, the best distribution system in the world is the local church. Yeah, it's so true. And we're on the ground in every single community. And I'm like, that was a whole new paradigm for me. Of course that's true. But you know, Rick and his brilliance, of course, thought of it. And, yeah. and that's how they delivered aid right. around the world. And so if you mm-hmm. think about a, a force for good, a force that mm-hmm. that multiplies, nothing is quite as great as a local church. Nothing has a potential oh, in a local no. church. And Absolutely. I think we got to move way beyond just this idea of filling up auditoriums. And you know what else mm-hmm. is true? Here's what's true. That group I'm trying to assemble, that's really, really hard to assemble because everybody travels so much. Mm-hmm. If any of them were in town that night and they had gotten mm-hmm. the text, they would have been mm. out there in their cars oh, too, absolutely. looking yeah. looking for that teenager. Mm. Who we you know, mm-hmm. well, we didn't, but the police ultimately found and mm-hmm. returned safely home. He just got mm-hmm. lost. Mm-hmm. So you know, anyway, that's a different reframing of it. Hopefully, that was helpful mm-hmm. to people. Any other yeah, yeah, yeah. dangling thoughts on church growth? Yeah, I, you know, I think th- there's a connected idea here that I think one of the, um, it's like a. At level 201, 301, maybe you put Rick Warren in my brain, so now I'm thinking about levels. Uh, <laughs> concept <laughs> that I think church leaders mm-hmm. don't often think about is there is a, in most churches, there's a correlation between the total number of volunteers that you have and the size of your of your church. And mm-hmm. we think, of, a lots of church leaders think about it backwards. They, they think about it from, they say, well, if I've got a church of 500 people, they're like, I need 50 volunteers to search of church, serve a church of 500 people. So uh, if we if we go to 600, well, I guess I need a few more. And they, it's like they, they think that volunteers are an outcome, that it's like you know, the, the church will grow and then we will get more volunteers. It's not actually yeah, that. The crowd the, will build the core, right? Yeah. But it's, it's actually the, the other way. It's the other way around. You've got to first engage more volunteers. Like, And most churches have a, there's an uncanny sticky number. It's three to one. Like, the, give me the total number of volunteers that you have serving at your church. And typically churches have a three to one ratio. They have three times as many people actually attending their church. Mm. So the simple math there is like, what if you, what if you went and tried to engage 50% more volunteers this year, what would happen? Um, and, you know, time and again, we've seen what happens is because what happens is the amount of work you need to do to, enca- to, to, to cast vision, to get people excited to be a part of the church, to get plugged in. And, and frankly, people adjust their lives. If they're not volunteering and then they are volunteering, what happens? It gets back to that loose ties. People at work on Monday say, hey, how was the weekend? And you're like, oh, actually, it was great. I helped out at church. What? What do you mean you helped out at church? Oh, yeah, I'm volunteering at the church now. 
they, that becomes another one of those things. So we, I think we often think of, or I shouldn't say we often, I think some church leaders can get caught in the trap of they they have tried to have a minimal amount of volunteers. They try to do it with as few people as possible because volunteers are a hassle. And that's just not true. It's the other way around. We should actually be trying to figure out how do we get more and more people? Like we, it shouldn't be, um, let's reduce it to the smallest number possible. It should be actually, we're trying to get more people. It, if it's like, okay, it takes eight people to do the greeters team on a Sunday morning, and you've got full rosters, great. Let's figure out how to do it with 12. Like there's got to be more we can do there. What, you know, let's, if, if, if it takes 25 ki- people in kids ministry and you've got all 25, which no person listening in is kids ministry ever have, there's never enough people in kids <laughs> ministry. But if, if you did, uh, theoretically, let's, let's keep finding ways to up the service because actually the act of in growing, and I've just seen that time and again, it's too many church leaders. They're like, well, We'll launch that next service. We'll add this capacity. We'll do this thing uh, down the road when we have some more people, when there's a need for it. And there's historic precedents for this. You know, the uh, t- Tony Morgan's been talking about this for a number of years. You know, as the number of staff, as the, the ratio of your, between staff to attendees goes down. So as you have a fewer number of attenders to staff, your growth tends to slow. And why is that? It's because you are moving what should be done by volunteers into a professional realm. And those people don't have friends. They have, they've talked to all their friends about coming to the church. They, 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 all their social network is, is tapped out. Well, what you should be doing is trying to figure out how do we get our staff, it's Ephesians 4, how do we get our staff to actually be equipping other people to have more volunteers? The, the, we should be rewarding people with huge teams that keep growing. That's that's what the goal of it is, not to figure out how to do it with fewer, not to graduate to saying, oh, now I manage three staff, I don't have to manage any volunteers. And there's, you, you know, you don't need to look long, much farther than like historic mainline churches where this is the case, right? You go to... Um, you know, historic churches in Europe where they have like three curators who their job is to curate the art in the building. And then they have one, you know, pastor and they have 12 people that show up on a Sunday. Like that's not a stretch that happens in a lot of those historic yeah. churches and it's become completely professionalized. There's no volunteers involved at all. Be- and, and, and that's the outcome of that. There's a real danger with us, you know, n- turning off the volunteer spigot, which, you know, related to our earlier question is a part of the dynamic that has happened. People are pulling back. They're not as engaged. Um, and what well, we've got to push against that, we've got to find more ways to get them plugged in, get more people plugged in, more people on teams, you know, expanding our teams uh, at, as a growth engine, like as a, this will help us get, this part of why I love multi-site is because it, it, it forces you to figure out, we got to go find a hundred more volunteers somewhere. I don't know where they're going to come from. We've got to go find out and figure out where they go. That's, you know, that's the, the, the mechanics, the flywheel behind why multi-site works is because you're releasing all these new volunteers into a new community. Of course, they're going to tell their friends, we're launching this thing at church. I've never volunteered before. And I showed up on the weekend and we had to do this stuff and you should come visit us. That's, that's what's driving it. Um, so I don't know, it's just a, it's a related idea, but engagement, don't ignore the volunteer piece. Don't, it don't break that, break the mindset that we want to do this with as few people as possible. It's got to be the other way around. We actually want to do this with as many people as possible. We want to find, get as many people onto the team, as many people, uh, into the core as possible. And I think volunteering, giving, and being engaged beyond Sunday, that's what drives engagement. Those are the three biggies. I want to talk about church planting. I was trying to channel my inner Rich Birch earlier <laughs> this week on the live Q&A, but somebody said, hey, we are launching a new church. You know, what number should we be aiming for on Sunday one? And I was trying to paraphrase your mm. theory. And I said, you know, well, depending on your context, like 200 is always a great first Sunday, but you get a lot mm. of well-wishers, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, they all leave and you're stuck with mm-hmm. 75 or 100. But I said and I think I got this right, your philosophy of church planting is don't worry so much about the crowd, think about the core. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about how those numbers work in -hmm. church planting, like why you should be building a volunteer core and how do you know when you have enough volunteers to really launch a strong opening Sunday first service kind of thing? Because we have a lot of church planters listening. It blows my mind. Every time I talk to church leaders, how many people launched a church in the last three years? It's crazy, man, which is awesome. Yeah, it's yeah. cool, right? Like there's, I, I was saying that to a friend recently. There's so many churches you run into and, and Liquid was actually one of these where 
they have the story of uh, the weekend after 9-11 was a pivotal weekend. It was like, we launched on that weekend. We And, and I'm now the same thing's happening. It's like, oh, we launched our church, you know, February 2020, or we launched in, you know, the first weekend in March. Like I keep hearing these stories, which is, or or Me we too. launched a year later or like, which is so cool. So yeah, so there's, you know, there's some mechanics here to think about. So stick with me for a minute friends. Like I, so I'm a church leadership wonk. I could talk about this stuff all day long. I would argue that the hardest barrier to get over growth barrier is the 200 barrier. And you're you're just going to have to accept that as my, my thesis. There's a lot we could talk about there, but I I literally think it's harder than any other barrier. It's harder than 500, a thousand, 2000, 5,000. It's, it's a, it's a hard barrier to get over. And so I would work backwards from, and and it has to do with the, the social structures and, 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 you know, people's ability to, under under 200, they're really focused on you as the leader. Above 200, you've had to build structures that can multiply. And so that sets up a structure which, which then can grow beyond that. But so many get stuck below 200 because it's so much about the lead pastor. That's sketch. There's a lot we could talk about there. So working backwards from that, I absolutely agree with you, Carrie. And, and you're saying it was something you heard from me. So it's a little bit weird because I feel like I'm agreeing with myself. But when you're launching, you should ignore... Ignore the like, are you coming to attend our church? And for years of launching campuses, 13 direct campuses, coached a bunch of other churches around it. There's very few things I'm dogmatic about. The one, because there's lots of different ways to do it. The one thing I'm dogmatic about is we should not have a process by which we either ask for people to attend or that we uh, we we record if they're going to attend or not. It should all be about volunteering. It should just be about, are you coming to help us? Are you coming mm. to be a part of it? Now, you'll get a bunch of people on opening weekend, and that's fine. I You know, I was, I'm was i always uncomfortable on opening weekend because it's like, I know most of these people aren't going to be back. Like, these are just mm-hmm. people that are here. They're like, you know, they're family friends. It's like the guy from the pizza shop who we bought four pizzas from in the last six weeks. And like, it's not people that are really not that interested or, or it's like the, it's the principal from the school we're renting from. It's, you know, it's the finance person from the bank. Cause they can't believe that we're actually doing it. Like it's these people that, that are not really going to ever attend. And so for me, the number is, is 75. I think there's a magic thing that happens at 75. And I talked a little bit about it there earlier at 75 volunteers. If the three to one ratio is right, your, your church attendance, your birth weight. So after you first launch, birth like, weight. You know, it's like you get fat and then you'll come down a little bit. Like you'll, you'll, you know, it's not the, like the not opening weekend, opening weekend is probably more than 200, but, but you know, after a month or six weeks, it'll settle back down. And it should, if you have 75 volunteers, you should settle back down to around that 200, 225 people on the three to one ratio that we see, you know, time and again, I've seen that. Uh, that ratio work a bunch in churches. I, there's a church I'm coaching right now that's launching a campus and they, so they're right in this zone right now. And they're, you know, they're in their movement. They would say they're, they're a fairly large church, about 1500 people, but they're in a, they're like the, the strange one in their community. They're like the average church in their community is like literally 40 people, like in their kind of denomination, it's like 40 people, quite small. Um, and so when we started talking a year and a half ago, I was like, well, you guys should be trying to launch with 75 to hundred. They're like, that's crazy. That's like bigger than most of our churches. And I'm like, exactly. Like we do not want to get, you don't want to launch this thing out of the gate under 200. So, so 75, I would say is a good benchmark, but the reason why is not because it's magical and that's people who are serving. So that's like, and by serving, I mean, on rosters, they're saying, yes, they're actually helping. And so what that functionally means, and I know our friends at ARC who have now planted over a thousand churches, they, they have a similar kind of coaching they give their people where they talk about delaying the public launch. Like in, until you get uh, a healthy core and a large enough core, you want to delay your launch. Don't, you can launch too early. You can, you can go too mm-hmm. fast because once you get out of the gate, it's very, it becomes very hard to, vol- to get volunteers. It becomes very hard. Even just functionally, it becomes harder to cast vision when the thing is running. It's easier to cast vision when it's not running because it's all about potential. <laughs> you know, once we get up and running, it's like now we got actually all the problems of running. So, you know, hold the launch. I would say delay a season. If you, you know what, what's it going to take to get that, that kind of 75 people, I think is a key, you know, a key metric. Now I know there's church planners that are listening in that are like, uh, I don't know how to do that. Like that's, that's a ton. And you know, the, the thing that we, that has been proven over years now is that church plants that work have a few things in common. The one thing we've talked about here, a large and healthy core, they've also had, they're also in a network. So they're a part of 
arc or they're a part of some a, a denomination that ha- that has like actual church planting coaching. So that that's a that's a dynamic, and they're well funded. Like those are the three things that keep coming back. It's like they they are you know they have a healthy core, large healthy core. They're in a network and they have funding. And if you're if you're thinking about launching with 15 people, and let's just see what happens, and let's do a bunch of Facebook ads, and maybe we'll get 500 people to show up. Like we'll dump twenty five thousand dollars on Facebook ad, and a bunch of people will show up. I'd say like don't do that. That's take the extra time, build volunteers. You know, you got to figure out how you're going to get in front of people. How are you going to find more volunteers uh, before you launch? Yeah, no, that's so good. And you know, one of one of the things that happened too is some five campus churches discovered that probably only three are viable in the future, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Some churches had three services. Now they're down to two or one. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. When you're looking at having had momentum in the past and rebuilding it. Any suggestion there? Is it still focus on the core, focus on the core, focus on the core, build that up? Or what advice would you have to leaders who find themselves in that position where they are dealing with uh, some kind of fraction of what they used to have? Yeah, I, I think there is something around, if, if you had moments and you don't have it anymore, I would look very carefully at are there are there things that are tapping the energy of our church? And can we refocus that energy on a few things that do have some momentum on them already, you know, like how, how can we cut out some of those things that are, um, you know, are not, aren't, you know, aren't core, you know, recently I was, I was talking to a church leader who a historic church, been around, well, historic, and this is the problem with, you know, it's probably 30 years old, 40 years old. So it's not oh, new. Historic. It's probably, Whole other it's not, century. It's not, Whole other I know, century. I know. It's not, it's not really historic, but you know what I mean? Been around for a while. Yeah, and, they've been uh, around. And, mm-hmm. and, they, and, there's, and they've lost some momentum. And one of the things this leader was saying to me, we were talking about this, like, you know, cutting and all that. And the, the founding pastor, who's no longer there, started this pet project ministry that is, is very intensive to run. And this person, it was kind of like their pride and joy. They st- stood up and talked about it a lot. They had lots of stories. They kind of functionally liked hanging around in that thing. So they would like always kind of tell those stories. And, but, but it's a drain. It's a, it's, it's, it's slowing the church down. There's, you know, it's, it's sucking resources. In this case, it's sucking staff resources and time. And, you know, you've got to, you know, you've got to, take the deliberate action towards saying, okay, what are we going to do? And these guys are doing this. We've got to actually pare that off, figure out what can we do to spin that off? What do we do to, there's probably other ways, better ways to met, to have that same need be met in a different way um, so that you can focus on a few things and, and to focus on them well. You know, the, the thing that surprises me, and I say this all the time when I engage with smaller church leaders, most of the churches I work with just, and we're far enough in, I can say this because it won't turn off too many people, are like a thousand plus. That's just true. Like I don't, I don't work with a lot of churches that are smaller, like, you know, a hundred people or something like that. But I'm shocked when I do, because I'm like, they have incredibly complex systems. They have lots of teams. They have like all these like committees. They have a very laborious leadership development process. That's way more, or leadership approval process. That's way more complex than a church yeah. of four or 5,000 people. Like, um, you know, that I was talking to a church recently that they were reducing their leadership team down to three people. And there was like, they, there was like some like, oh, what, you know, what, what is that about? And I'm like, that is a normal process. You see that time and again, as a church grows, mm-hmm. you see a focusing of, of energy and they're doing less. And so all the time I've said to church leaders, when I get a chance to interact with them that are in a church that's say less than 500, I'll say to them, I'm like, you probably have to cut stuff. You have to do less. The reality of it is large churches do fewer things. That's just true. Like that's a, that's a definitively true. Look at what they do. They do less. They're doing less. Now they're, they're focusing it more. They're putting more energy on it. So even practically, um, and I know we've talked about this in the past on podcasts, but like it's still true that people show up to our churches because of teaching, because of what is said on the weekend. The, the teaching is so critically important to what we do. And, you know, so many pastors are pulled in so many different directions. They go in all these different committee meetings and they're, you know, have got, they're trying to keep the founding pastor's pet project running, all that stuff. And they're ignoring their main thing, which is why people show up or they have some skill in that area. And so, 
you know, they, and they, for the first two years, they, because they had all their ideas from Bible college and all that, they could just get up and kind of wing it after a couple hours. But then you realize week three, four, five, six, seven, you can't do that anymore. You got to have a system. You got to have a way to develop content. You got to have a way to gather, you know, gather good information, gather feedback and, and all of that. And, and that's one of those areas that large churches focus on. Why are they, why are they able to do that? Why does Craig Rochelle still think about his message? Why does he still have time to do that? Because he said no to a whole bunch of other stuff, right? They said, well, we're going to, we're going to focus on these few things. So if you're, if you're lacking momentum, I, the thing I would be looking at is, okay, what, where are some areas that we just got to get a bit ruthless and say, we got to cut back. We can't do that anymore. We're, we used to do that. We don't anymore. Yeah, it's great. It's great that you mentioned Craig. I mean, just he'll be on here again soon. Um, mm-hmm. We're setting it up, but he, you know, he leads the largest church, the largest attended church in the history of North mm-hmm. America. Just think about that for a second. That's mm-hmm. Life Church mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. You know what? You know what he does with his Tuesdays? You can't touch him. He's writing yeah. his message. Yeah. Now, you would think he's got fires left, right, and center with 34, yeah. 35 locations, but it's like, nope, Tuesday, I'm working on my message. And you're right, back to, because I've been through the, you know, zero to 1200 mm-hmm. cycle in terms of growth in my own mm-hmm. leadership. Mm-hmm. but it's often those pastors of small churches that just feel pulled in a million directions because I had a funeral mm-hmm. on Tuesday and then a visitation mm-hmm. on Wednesday and then a committee meeting on Thursday and then this thing I had to go to on Friday and the sermon mm-hmm. had to wait till Saturday. That's mm-hmm. a recipe to stay in that stuck spiral, that 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 plateaued place for a long time. Yeah, and, and so think about that, friends. Like, think about what Carrie just said about Craig Rochelle. So, not only is like he has a monster leader, right? Like he's like just oh, does incredible, incredible stuff, a monster in a good way, like incredible, does a great, just incredible stuff. Um, and he's an incredible communicator too, right? He's one of those weird combos of those two things together, right? Like and mm-hmm. and, and which is amazing when you think about it on the communication front. He could skate. He could just like coast on it. Like, does he really need to work on this weekend's message? Eh, probably not. And that's probably true on any given week. He could probably phone it in. He could he could do the two hour thing and just like you know. But but he realizes, and this is the difference between you know amateurs and professionals or people who are just winging it and people who are trying to make a difference and you know sustained impact. He's saying no, like it's too important for that. I've got to work on it. I've got to slow down. I've got to, you know, it's it's tail as old as time. It's sharpening the axe. It's not just swinging the axe. I've got to I've got to take that time to do that work. Where you know and I know there's a ton of pastors who aren't. Frankly, can I say this out of love? People who are listening in, you're not Craig Rochelle, either leadership or communication, and you think you can do it in two hours a week? You think you can prep a message in two hours a week? Like, come on, like, what are you thinking? Like that, of course, that's not the case. So it's even more imperative that you figure out how to, you know, and, and, I, and I say that out of a place of love. I don't say that, I know it's no, no. hard. Like the, the dynamic that you're describing there is a ve- very real dynamic. Um, but, you know, we've got to, if we're, and, and, you know, on the teaching piece, particularly too many churches, I think, ignore that piece. And, and it's because it's a forest and trees issue. It's, it's, of course, teaching happens every week. So, you know, someone does that. I guess the lead guy does that. Um, but it would be like Starbucks not thinking about how they make coffee. It's like, it's like, right. well, why does Starbucks have a test kitchen in Seattle where they're constantly working on new things? Why do they do that? They don't need to do that, but they absolutely have to do that. They have to keep focused on how do we make great coffee? Because if, if they let that slip, McDonald's will come in, somebody else will come in and take it away from them. And so the same thing is true in our teaching, man, we've got to stay focused on that. We got to, and, and that comes to the invitability thing and all that, you know, we've, we've got to keep focused on that piece. And it's, it's, I know it sounds like humble pie or apple pie. It's, it's basic stuff, but it's so true for most of our churches. Well, and you get, you get, um, additional rewards just to, you know, stay with the Craig example. Literally just mm-hmm. this morning, I finished reading his next book. I think it's called the power to change. Uh, Mm -hmm. for endorsement purposes. So I'm reading an early copy of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, great book, great book. But Mm -hmm. what blew me away through it is, you know, I've read a lot of Craig's stuff. I've known him for years. I've listened to him. Mm -hmm. All the fresh stories. I'm like, dude, where Mm -hmm. are you getting these stories from? And Mm -hmm. it's not because they just pop into his head. It's Mm -hmm. because he's got a system. It's because he will spend a day, two days, just working on a chapter, working on a message, it's like, okay, I filed this story away. I can pull this one out now. And you're right. After two years of communication, you've kind of used up 
mm-hmm. all of your funny stories, the anecdotes, mm-hmm. the stuff that comes to you naturally. You've gotten mm-hmm. that message out. If you really want to be good 20, 30 years down the road without the discipline to set aside time to say no mm-hmm. to other things so you can say yes to what really matters, you're, mm-hmm. you're not going to get that. So actually, mm-hmm. it's a, I'll have to ask him about how what his system is uh, next time we get him on the show. Because mm-hmm. I was I was blown away. I'm like, wait, this is this is not recycled material. Right. I'm I'm a right. pretty astute student, and mm-hmm. like this is new. Like mm-hmm. that was really impressive. But that's mm-hmm. what happens when you block off Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever mm-hmm. whatever day mm-hmm. it happens to be on a consistent basis. And it's a unique challenge of leading in the church. Like it, you know, it's anybody else that does content for a living does not produce the amount of content that your average pastor produces. Like they. True. You know, go on the speaking circuit and you do the same stories over and over again. Exactly. (laughs) You've got three stories and four jokes and you just interchange them. Like, depend and you write them down and then you know you can basically come every other year and you'll be fine. Like, you know, stand up comedians will work a year to get an hour of content. They'll work on the same thing for a year to get, you know, and that's considered like, a, a, a big pace. Like, oh, they're, they're developing a yeah. lot of new content every year. They develop a whole hour of content, like a tight hour, like that. So that's a very real issue. Or like, you know, there are folks that are in the kind of business coaching, consulting in that like book writing space where, you know, this friends, you read their third book and you're like, this is the first book with different stories. Like it's, <laughs> it's the same thing. Like, it's like, it's an extension, 100%. right? Mm -hmm. where, you know, in the church, now the advantage we have is we're preaching to a fixed text. So if you're, if you're not a total heretic, you shouldn't be often, there's no like new, brand new ideas. We should be talking about, Hey, here is the, the things that are true. We're going to keep talking about those things over and over and over. So it's not like you're inventing totally new things. This is a little bit different than if you're just making up your own stuff, but it is, it's a lot like that's a discipline and it's, and it's unique to the church. It's, it's a unique Mm -hmm. thing. It's not, it's not a normal, I, I don't know if you've, and you've run with, in with a lot of people who don't, aren't necessarily within the church world, but I'm struck by that when I engage with communicators who are in the kind of marketplace, I'm like, oh, like they're good, but they're not great. Like they're, you know, they, or they just keep repeating the same stories over and over. So yeah, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. I, I, and, and guys like Craig, and that's the thing for everybody who's listening in, uh, that's th- that case is true. Craig may not be like he may not be an example. There's he may not be the example. There might be somebody else in your world who leads a big church or leads a kind of church that is thriving for you. And I guarantee you that that person has a system built around how they generate content. Like that is a, mm-hmm. it, they're not just winging it. They don't just show up on Sunday or they don't just do an hour. They don't squeeze it in between stuff. It's there's there's time blocked off on a regular basis uh, to make that happen. So one of the things that sort of undergirds everything we've talked about so far is, you know, conversations like this are so good. I love it. It feels like we're just having coffee or dinner, which is awesome. But, and um, a lot of people are like, I just don't have the energy for that. Like, yeah. this is this is a lot of stuff. Now, you know, believe it or not, in addition to unseminary and writing books and launching courses and helping people in the Art of Leadership Academy and all the other things that you do, Rich, um, you also lead a camp full time. Mm-hmm. And that was, imagine running a summer camp during lockdown. So just let that run oh, yeah. through your brain for about 10 <laughs> seconds. That's been Rich's world for two years and then reopening in 2022. Mm-hmm. But it left you pretty winded. Do you yeah. want to talk about that season? You and I had a coffee a couple yeah. months ago where mm-hmm. it was just really, really hard. And I think you can relate to how a lot of leaders are feeling. Yeah, absolutely. I think it gave, I think the last two years gave any leader with a, with a warm heart, more grace for other leaders. You know, I think we looked around and we're like, man, this is a tough season. Like this is, you know, I'll, I'll hear people, you know, dogging on other leaders or like, I can't believe they made a stupid decision or whatever. And I find myself coming to people's defense way faster and being like, yeah, like this is a strange time. And yeah, for sure. So running an overnight kids camp, we would normally have about 2,500 kids a summer, 200 summer staff, um, you know, because of our local idiosyncrasies of, and this is a non-political statement of, of the health system. We had two summers where we didn't operate and uh, really we, we, we said we operated, but we didn't really, we were nowhere near their normal capacity. And, you know, there was, there were dark days and, and I, I really haven't talked much about this publicly, but in spring 2020, there were dark days. It was like, I, I really, at that point we were 75 years old. It was our 75th 
uh, year, 2021 was our 75th year. And in the spring of 2021, I, or 2020, I really did think we were going to go bankrupt. And I had this like, um, real deep sense of, um, personal responsibility for that. And I, you know, when you stare down the abyss of like, oh, I'm going to be the one that's going to close this thing that has, you know, almost eight decades of, um, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, memories with people, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have been through that, that really weighed on me. And, you know, we, we are in the phase, we talked about our development right from the beginning. I stole this from Delta Airlines CEO. He talked about how, um, you know, COVID is going, their response to COVID is going to be in three phases. Talk about relief, which is literally just the initial months. Like, let's make sure we don't. And that for us, that was the punchline is don't go bankrupt. Like, just do everything you can to make sure that you can keep the thing from going bankrupt. And then the, there's this long middle phase called resilience, which was, hey, like, it, how do we kind of readjust? How do we ensure that we're, you know, we can last for a long time in that period? But that is then followed by relaunch. And I would say, really, we're just on the front end of relaunch now. Like we, like you said, we are, you know, summer 2022 is our first summer back. We had about 2,000 kids, which was great. Um, mm. You know, we we still, we lost money, which was not great. Um, but, uh, you know, it it has been a hard, long path. I think for me, so the 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 sanitized answer is it focused what our mission was. Um, the, 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 the kind of pithy leadership lesson is, um, you know, the thing that clarified for me was we talk about how our mission is to develop tomorrow's leaders through life-changing adventure in God's creation. And what, when our revenue source was taken away from us, we were unable to generate revenue. That didn't mean that our mission went away. We still were responsible for developing tomorrow's leaders through life-changing adventure in God's creation. Like that, we're still called to do that, regardless of whether we get money to do it or not. <laughs> Nowhere in there does it say, you know, and save money or, you know, make turn a profit every year. Like that, that isn't in our thing. Like that's not, we even said that. And so, um, I was really, frankly, during that whole period, was so struck by our team. We just kept asking the question, what does it mean to keep on mission? How do we do this? And like in that first spring, particularly, we had to lay everybody off. And so it was a couple hundred summer staff and, you know, sad conversations, students who were really looking forward to it. And because of the way it rolled out that spring, it was like end of May. It's like messy time. And But I was really proud of our team. Our team got in their cars, we printed staff shirts and they got in their cars. I get choked up when I tell the story and they drove from like to every kid's house and was like every one of our summer staff and like sat on their front porch, gave them their sa their staff shirt and were like, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm, and they knew by that point that we weren't going to meet, but it, but I was like so proud. And that wasn't my idea. That was our team. They're like, I think we should do this. I think we got to go and actually see these people. Like we can't, and you know, it was probably breaking the law at that point. <laughs> like we probably weren't allowed to do that, uh, but we did. And and I was so proud. And there was a bunch of that. That was one example of like, we have to keep plugged in with leaders. We have to keep plugged in with young leaders and they need us now more than ever. You know, I think on the personal side, I think it has refocused my own. It's There's been a lot of kind of, navel gazing time thinking about what is what is my unique contribution and i think i'm still very much actively in that conversation what what part of this thing that i'm leading because there's the things we lead and then there's us as humans and there hopefully is a difference between those two <laughs> like hopefully they don't get so blurred that we get so lost but i think there if i'm honest there's a part of it that i got lost in some of that like a typical leader i was like i was excited by the fact that 2017 2018 2019 were our three biggest years ever we were roaring to the gates and like hey we're going to head towards historic highs and like thinking about building stuff and like you know expansion 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 and and i would like to think at the time i was like well that's just you know isn't that great god's at work and i think i would probably say that but if i was honest there was a part inside of me that was like yeah but that's actually me at work like that's that's a part of me and there's i think this those years had to break some of that off and be like, like, that's unhealthy. Like, you shouldn't actually mm. think like that. Like, it's okay to be, it's okay to, I, I think it's okay. I, I'm hesitant, obviously, to say this. I think it's okay still to be ambitious for what God wants to do. Like, I, I you know, I, mm. I think he calls us to do that. I think by definition, a leader is someone who is guiding people to a more desired future. That is at its most basic form. That's what leaders do. And I do feel like that's, been my life's work. Like my job is to help people, places, things get to a more desired future. That is what I'm called to do. And so by definition, 
Like we sh things should be getting better. If they're not getting better, you're not, I would say I'm not leading. Like I'm not, I, I'm managing, I'm doing some, some other function, but I'm not actually leading. And I think I'm called to lead. So, you know, there, there has been interest, a bunch of introspection in this period, trying to think about, okay, where do the lines between me and the organization, you know, where do they, where do they diverge? Where, and where are they common, right? Where, what is it about what we're doing that is, is very much who I am and is very much aligned with my passions and what I think I can offer. And, but then what are those things that are, are not, you know, you know, who I am and, and what do I do with those? How do I, how do I manage that? Um, you know, I think through that process, I was really proud of our team. Again, it's all about our team. I was really proud of our team, how we navigated the, the tensions of COVID. Um, I, we're we're a pretty diverse team. Um, we're everybody's Christian, so we have that in common, which is a good thing. But we come from a wide spectrum of, I would say, the small e evangelical world. Like, not everybody would even necessarily would use that word. They wouldn't use that language. And then some people would would. Um, and so there's a lot of diversity in that. And we have people that have a lot of diversity around masking and vaccines and. And, and, and I was really proud with, we tried to, from the beginning say, Hey, how do we, we want to keep everybody together. We are trying to keep people focused. We're trying to, you know, I, I want our team to come out the other side of this. I don't want to lose people. How, how do we, how do we respect the differences, have healthy conversation and realize like, I may not see this the way you see this. And I think that's been positive. That's been like, a, Oh, those are good muscles that, you know, we built that I'm hoping will help us as we go forward. Cause I, I think there's more of that to come, right? Like there's more we've we've tried to be as an organization a bit of a gathering place i you know we talked about the the divisive or the polarized culture i would like to think we're not one of those places we're trying to be the kind of place where um people who come from you know different very different churches can can serve together where their kids can go to camp together their their young leaders can be equipped together there are two churches in the toronto area that um, are two churches that would, I think publicly people would say, those are very different churches. Like they're, they're both Christian. They both love Jesus, but they're different. Like they're, they have a different yeah. approach. I think if you know, you know, you, you know, the kind of thing I'm talking about, if you're a church leader, well, both of those churches are, they're like number one and number two on the kind of sending, but on our staff and on campers. And I take that as a point of pride. Like we can get all these people to work together. Um, it's going to be okay. Like we don't need to, you know, we can stay focused on what God's called us to be. And you know, that's fine. I don't know. What does that do for you as a leader? Is there's like a muscle there that I think I do feel like I'm stronger on coming out of COVID? Like, hey, I think we have to keep in that space. I think, and, and it's a part of what I appreciate, but you, carry. I do feel like you, you know, you're a big tent leader. You're not trying to kick people out. You're trying to say like, hey, how do we, how do we create a place where people who, you know, love Jesus, want to see the church grow? Uh, how do we keep those people focused on doing more of that? And and I would say coming to COVID, I'm more convinced of that now than I was even before. I'm like, I, I want that to be a part of what I do. I, I don't want to be divisive. I, I, that I think is a real problem for us as we go forward. You, you mentioned the, the sanitized version. I think a lot of us have mm -hmm. had unsanitized versions over the last few yeah. years and at different yeah. points in our lives. Like when you think about that, to the extent that you're comfortable sharing, yeah. what are some of the unsanitized moments you had to navigate as a leader? <laughs> well, hopefully this doesn't, uh, this doesn't, lose you listeners. It's probably okay if it loses people who don't like me because it's true. I, you know, in the spring of 2020, I probably drank more alcohol than in the spring of 2020 than I did maybe in the 10 years before. <laughs> and it wasn't like I was getting hammered. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like I was like, um, you know, I, I don't, I wasn't getting drunk. That wasn't, I wasn't crossing that line, but I would say it was a more of a habit. It was in fact, there were times even during that process, I remember multiple times I've heard you preach where you, you know, you've kind of, and it's not, it's not all the time, but you've put the, the finger on the like, hey, what are you doing with alcohol? What is that? You know, what is that? Not with me specifically, mm. but just as an example, like in a preaching yeah. example. And it's the, it's the classic example. It's coming of like, after you, Rich. Yeah, yeah. No, it's the classic example of like, <laughs> yeah, on the weekend, you might have a glass of wine normally, and that's fine with dinner, enjoy, you know, but when that becomes, when it goes from a week to like, well, it's now Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and then, well, then Monday night too, and then Tuesday afternoon, you know, like that, it becomes a problem. And so that, I, that was for sure, you know, that was a, when I look back at them, I'm like, yeah, that's not, that's not healthy. You know, that was, um, you know, not a, um, and you know, not a, not a positive behavior by any means um, that, you know, we, my wife was super gracious about, I, I don't know about you in your life, Tony's an amazing woman. Uh, as well, but I, you know, I've often joked that the voice of God sounds a lot like the voice of my wife, 
And, you know, she, Mm -hmm. yeah, she was very Mm -hmm. gracious through that, but also was like, you know, has raised that flag and been like, Hey, like what's going on here? Like, I'm not so concerned actually about the actual function of what's happening here. I'm more concerned about what's underneath of that, what's happening there that is leading to a change of behavior. Biography of, of Eugene Peterson. No, no. Okay. I read it. And that was really interesting. I think he got extra good in the second half. Mm -hmm. But he talks about that perhaps being one of Eugene Peterson, who I so admire, one of Mm -hmm. his regrets or vices Mm -hmm. that was Mm -hmm. one too many glasses of bourbon or scotch or whatever Mm -hmm. it was, whiskey, Mm -hmm. uh, at night most nights. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I can tell you as somebody who enjoys a glass of wine from time to time, Mm -hmm. there were times (laughs) over the last two years where I said to Tony, oh, it'd be nice to have a drink right now, wouldn't it? And Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's one of those things where I think uh, those of us who do enjoy that from time to time have really had to check it. And I I appreciate what you're sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, and I say that to folks that are listening in, that I think I, um, you know, interestingly, so in my history, my family history, we have, uh, you know, really dark examples of alcoholism. And so alcohol has always been one of those things that as on particular on my side of the family has been like a, um, like the, it's a, we've been sober and have thought about it. Like, it's not, this is not like a, it's not a, it's not just something that you kind of do. It's like a, you know, you really, it's a, and like, that's don't mess with that kind of thing. And so, yeah, I think that, so it might not be alcohol, but I think we all do have self soothing behavior that, um, we've got to watch, we've got to figure out, okay, where, well, how does that fit in our leadership? One. Yeah. I mean, obviously, in a lot of circles where perhaps alcohol isn't viewed the same way, mm-hmm. you know what I think the top candidate is? Food. Food. Oh, sure. It's like, Absolutely. oh, gosh. Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. been an emotional comfort for me over the years. But mm-hmm. there's a lot of a lot of church leaders I know who would just judge you for, mm-hmm. um, for drinking too much, but they think nothing about eating too much. And it's right. like, oh, oh wait a minute. Not the way yeah. I read scripture. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Well, you Anything know, it's, I, no, go ahead. Finish the thought. No, I was just going to say, I think, you know, I think the coming out of that, you know, that season, I think trying to get clear with myself, you know, with, you know, with the leaders that are around me, um, I think is an important piece of, you know, is it, it's a, it's an important lesson because there's, you know, we, we burned a lot of time there, at least in my world, it was basically two years of, the a core part of my vocation was really up in the air. Like it was like, I, who knows what's going to happen here? And in some ways it still is. There's, you know, we're still wrestling with a lot of issues there. Um, but, and I know that's not everybody's experience. I know that's not universally true. It's, it's, it's because of this, the uniqueness of this particular type of ministry. Overnight kids camp is literally the, it's like the opposite of social distancing. It's like, get everybody together, pack them into a room. And so it makes sense that during that it was, it was, I, you know, I'm not fighting any of that. It makes sense that that was, but it, it it is like it's a lot of time thinking thinking to yourself. So, yeah, I don't know. It, interesting season, and you know, I, I'm hoping, you know, as we go into the future, that you know the lessons learned, my own lessons around that, or just leadership in general. That you hope, man, I hope I've gained some more wisdom and some more grace, you know, for other leaders, and um, you know, and and, I, and I'm not the only one who I know, you know, I've I've had that private conversation with multiple leaders that like, hey. Whatever the food, there's lots of them on that list. The self-soothing behaviors, a lot of those things that people could give themselves to that have found themselves over the last couple of years. Um, And, you know, we still may be in for that. You know, whatever's happening with the economy here, you know, we're heading into another bit of a tricky season here. And so, you know, I think we want to be really clear on, you know, what what place does that stuff have in our lives? What has helped you move through that season or what is helping you move through that that low that you, you have felt? which mm. so many leaders have felt. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, so I, you'll get a kick out of this, Carrie. I'm, I, I have for years kind of railed on worship music and been like, I don't really like worship music. Like, I, and, and there's still some truth to that. Like I'm like, and, and I, so it's now moved from worship music to Christian music. Like, there's something that can be a bit goofy sometimes about Christian music. I don't know what, what that is, mm. but that has shifted in the last couple of years. I was thinking about that the other day. I'm like way faster to like, turn on the, you know, worship, 
you know, on Spotify and have that be what's running, you know, in my head as I'm doing email. And, mm-hmm. and, and I have found that that is a positive, you know, that's a po- it has a positive impact on the, okay. Like keeping focused on what is it that God wants for me? Um, it sounds like so basic, but it's true. Um, no, you know, that, I think the, that matters. The, the, uh, you know, I think the, the, on the physical side, so I was always a guy that went to the gym uh, a couple days a week, which was great. I, during uh, COVID, I bought a Peloton and I'm like addicted to it. So I've transferred maybe one addiction to another, but I, I love that. It's I not think a it's bad a, addiction. Yeah. Getting, you know, being active. I've really enjoyed that. That's been, uh, you Dude, know, and, and it's some pounds. I mean, we've talked I, yeah, about I definitely that. have. Like you have yeah, you have. I have, which has been great, but I, you know, it is, I find I'm at the point now and I remember I hearing people say this kind of stuff. I was never the guy that was like, oh, I love working out. I love, like, we and I have a mutual friend, Rob Meter, who, like, yeah. he is like, he's like my like quintessential. I should probably say this to his face now. I'm saying in front of 70,000 people. He's like, yeah. he is like the, get jumps on his bike and goes, he's like Mr. Energy. Like, he's yeah, always he just, going. He just came back from the Italian Alps, okay? Yes. And then I went riding with him after that. It's like, yes. yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks for yeah. riding with the tractor. I, I, and an athlete, exactly. And a, like a, a born yeah. athlete, I was never that guy. I was the drama kid guy. I liked reading. I was never an athlete. And so I never really perceived myself as that. And so, but the Peloton fit within, fits within a, a bandwidth where it's like, it's just enough to like, I, it's, a, it's a real cardio workout. Like I'm sweating and all that and profusely and I had to change my clothes and um, what I work out in because it doesn't work and <laughs> what I was wearing before and all that. Um but it also is like, it's positive and upbeat and there's enough community there and enough stuff on the screen that keeps me engaged. But now it's like, I, I, it, I notice the days that I don't, I don't do it. I'm not as clear. I'm not as sharp. I'm not as, um, I'm not as focused. Um, you know, I, 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 and I, there is a connection between that and even the drinking thing where I'm like the days I'm tired and, you know, I'm, it's easier to be like, oh, well, maybe I'll just have, you know, I'll have a drink tonight or whatever. And that when I'm on top of that, I, it doesn't, it's not as, it's not as bad. So I, that has been fantastic. I think staying connected to my wife, my, you know, Christine is an incredible woman. We've always had, I shouldn't say always had, we have had for the last 10 years, a really solid relationship. You know, 10 years ago, we went through, we did a bunch of counseling and talked through a bunch of stuff and got to a much better place that has continued. And I think COVID has actually been really good for us. We have more rhythms around staying connected and um, communicating and, and talking and trying to have some shared life together than we have in the past. And I think a bunch of that's just my own maturing. You just get older and spend more time together and you realize like, oh, like, like, this is great. We should spend more time together. And so, um, you know, the, that has been real positive and definitely a part of what God has used in this, you know, in this period. And, you know, even the questions we're talking there around the kind of like, hey, how, what's the line between the organization and you? She's been really good at asking insightful questions in the midst of that, like helping me think that through a little bit because she obviously sees me really clearly. Um, so, and then all the rhythms of staying plugged into church. Like I, again, this is, none of this is rocket science for the people that are listening in, but I like love going to church. Like I love showing up. I love, like I, I'm not quite the guy. If I, if I go on vacation, I maybe skip a Sunday, but like I, I'm not looking for a reason not to go. Like I, I love going. Like if, if I'm, if I'm not volunteering, I'll show up. And if I don't have anything on, I still love like showing up. And that was true through all that. It's true being, you know, connected with a a small group. And I like the challenge of like, these are people that, you know, know me a little bit and they will push into my life and, and vice versa. I get to know them. And, and there's the, I like the, or I, I have seen the benefit of, um, the, of trying to develop relationships with people that I don't know real well, which I like that in the group thing. Cause I think that does, it moves me beyond myself and continuing to, to read scripture and stay plugged in. I've, you know, I got plugged in in the last, uh, there's a, a friend of mine who's involved in the camp. Her name's Hannah. She's incredible, incredible leader. That's like a whole other story where, where we are today, largely because of her leadership. She did an amazing job through COVID, but for probably the last 18 months, she's been talking about the Lectio 365 app which is like a reading app, a Bible reading app, mm-hmm. prayer app put up by the per 24 seven people. And, you know, I, I was like, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. And I would recommend it to people. I'm like, Hannah says it's great. You should do it. And then like last spring, I like picked it up and same thing. I'm like, it's just something good about slowing down and, you know, and having kind of the, the morning office, evening office rhythm that, uh, that so many people have talked about, but has never really been a part of yeah. my my pattern. Um, to have that in there has been just fantastic. So, 
It's, I don't know. Those would be a number of the things. None of that's rocket science. It's like, you know, I, it's all the stuff that we've heard before, but actually trying to live it out and do it is, is, has made all the difference for sure. Well, we're probably, and this is why I love having you back on on a regular, I'm looking at my questions. I'm like, yeah, we didn't hardly touch any of it. <laughs> we got to the great. first four, I think. It's a good conversation. <laughs> um, what are you paying attention to these days? What are you really looking at? Because I, I think you, you do a really good job and we've known each other, I don't know, almost 20 years now, mm-hmm. but I think it goes back that far. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, you always have an eye to the future that mm-hmm. is unique. That's in nice. my Thank world. You. So what are you paying attention to? What are you thinking of? What are you what are you watching that maybe mm-hmm. you think, hey, that would be fun for other leaders to look at that too? Yeah, so I, I, the one thing personally I, over the last year I've um I've really sensed that I should be on a mission or I am on a mission depending on the day, depending on how confident I'm feeling, on a mission to help 100 churches grow by 1000 people. And so I, I really want to, there's lots of stuff that I talk about. There's lots of things, lots of the ways I'm happy to help churches, but I really want to focus on that issue. I want to help churches figure out how they can reach more people. And I want to focus more of my time, effort, energy, resources on that. You know, I don't feel like uh, an old leader. I feel like, and I, but I don't feel like a young leader anymore. I feel like I'm in that, you know, that kind of like, been around a few times, uh, but there are less laps ahead of me, I think, than behind me. Yeah. And so I need Your to- 40s like, are an interesting decade. Yeah. yeah. I got to focus on, okay, how? what are the things that, where, where do I want to leave impact? And so that's part of it personally. So I'm, I would say, more excited to learn from growing churches than I've ever been before and want to spend more time, effort, and energy. You know, I think I'm, I would say I'm bullish. When I think about the future, I'm bullish on hybrid church that has a strong- um, in-person element that, ha- but is, isn't, I think for too long, we had this like dichotomy online, you know, in person, all of that. I, I don't think, so I'll put the, the, the statement out there that was going to get me in trouble with Dave Adamson, but like, I don't think that meta th- is going to do it. I don't think metaverse is going to do it. I just don't. I think we're going to, we're locked into in-person experiences. I think it is as foundational as our physical bodies. Like, I think there's something about getting in the room with other people that we have to keep doing. Now, I think it's going to look different. Um, you know, I've I've joked in the past that I think one of the biggest hybrid churches out there is is the If movement. Um, you know, it they are they don't call themselves a church. They don't they don't refer to themselves that way. But they really are. They're they're a a whole bunch of small groups. They do conferences where they get people together. They do a bunch online. They do, you know, materials. They do discipleship. They do all of that stuff. Now, again, they would, you know, Janine would kill me if if she referred to it as a church. But I think that's a good model for what it looks like in the future. And so it might be, you might be like online and you know, you don't, you only show up once every six months to an actual in-person, but I think that in-person thing is a part of it. I think, I I think you've, and it might be that you show up for a conference or you might go to, um, you know, a whole conference week. Uh, we were talked about London earlier, you know, our friends at HTB in, in the UK, they do a camp. They call it a camp, but what it is, it's like Woodstock. They just go in the country, they just go out and they literally rent like this field and they, it's like, literally thousands, tens of thousands of people just camp for like a week and they do church together and they do life. There's something really beautiful about that. Is that, that their focus thing? Is that what that, yes. is that what yeah, that's yeah. called or what is it called? Yeah, yeah that's focus. what it's called. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, what a fascinating uh, kind of approach to ministry. And I, so when I think to the future, I, I and I don't think anybody's doing it. I think it's a mixture of all of those things. I actually think if is the closest thing. The if movement is the closest thing to what I think our churches are going to look more and more like in the future, where it's like, we've got all these different ways that people can engage. And we've got, you know, we've got some in person, some online, both are happening at the same time. They're both concurrent. And, but I, but I don't think, and it's, and it, it's kind of re- resisting the dichotomy, the false dichotomy of like, you're either one or the other. I, I do actually think, and I realize it you know, maybe isn't popular, but I think, I think we have to do both. I think there's something about getting people together, but then people live so much online and so much in their phone. We obviously can't ignore that. That's not like a, a like, wow, whiz bang kind of thing. Um, but I, I do think that we're not there yet. It's the same questions we've been saying about church online since 2008, 2009, when we started doing it, which is we're asking the right questions online, but we haven't found the answer yet. It's, it's, 
there, there are for the for the middle of the bell curve. There, sure, there are people who live on the fringes who will just connect with us online. Who will, you know, who that's their only approach. But I, but even those people, I would say, we we may not get together with them regularly. They may only show up once a year for a conference. They may only come on a weekend. Uh, but I I think we should still try to do that. We should still try to, uh, you know, push towards that. I love what Saddleback has been saying about, you know, their their online experience. The kind of pinnacle thing they're trying to do is to move people towards small groups and then some sort of gatherings. They're trying to figure out how they get people in a room. I think there's something to that. Um, again, who knows? I you know I we'll see. But I, so I'm intrigued by that. Intrigued by growing churches. I think there's no better season now than to reach. The community, like I, I think we're we're throwing off. I I feel bad for people. Most of my experience has been serving. Well, all my experience has been serving. Direct experience has been serving in communities where a small percentage of people every day, every weekend, could wake up and go to church. Like four or five percent. You know, I think, and that's the future. That is what's happening. Like if you're in a community where 30, 40, 50 percent attend church, those days are behind us. Like you are. The, give, it you know, a, give it a few years. Yeah, yeah, give it a few years. We're all going to end up there. And so I'm I'm more intrigued than ever about churches that are, you know, figuring out what does it look like in the in that in that world. How do we do that? And the needs I think are are bigger than they've ever been before. And I think the future is bright. I think as we invest in leaders, as we invest in next generation, they'll figure out new models. They'll figure out what it looks like, and and folks like you and I get to cheer them on and offer some wisdom, but they'll invent better stuff than we ever did. And we get to be around them and watch and, and, and be the positive leader. I'm a Gen Xer. And with this, I close, it's like a preaching statement. You know, I learned that from my preacher friends like you. With this, I close, which they mean they've got another 10 minutes of content. But, (laughs) you know, I was born in 1974. I'm the, it's the lowest birth rate year of the, of the 20th century. I'm classic Gen X squeezed between boomers and, and then everybody that came after me, millennials, Gen Z, all of that. And most of my ministry has been about kind of taking things from the boomers and giving them to millennials. I'm excited about accelerating more of that in, uh, you know, the coming years. I think there's lots of opportunity there as we try to figure out how to reach more people as we look to the future. I will make sure we link to uh, my interviews with Jenny Allen, the founder of the IF movement Mm -hmm. in the uh, show notes. And also, you know, the other guy, I don't know that you'd agree with this or not, but he was in no hurry to reassemble in person. Mike Todd, Transformation mm-hmm. Church in mm-hmm. Tulsa. Yeah, I think he's got something going on about the future church too, about a mm-hmm. movement that is huge, mm-hmm. that has physical expressions, and they're mm-hmm. not always regular. So mm-hmm. I got to have Mike back on. Yeah, I know. I would agree. Absolutely. Rich, yeah. man, I got to tell you, this has been so refreshing and life-giving, and thanks for being so honest and vulnerable. Um if people do not subscribe to the Unseminary podcast, I do. What are you waiting for? You should be there. You should check out Rich's stuff. Join his email list. Uh, visit his website at unseminary.com. Are you working on anything big right now or anything you want to point people to? No, those are all good. You know, in the background, you know, we're plugging away on some new stuff, but that's a great place to send people to. I'd be honored if they uh, if they drop by there. That'd be that'd be fantastic. And I appreciate you, Carrie, what you're doing. I, I've said this to you offline, but one of my the greatest joys of my life is uh, knowing Carrie Newhoff at, before he was Carrie Newhoff. And I, I love on the other end when I'm in, and this happened to me last week. I was in a group of people who don't know that I know you as like a real human, and they talk wildly about how you've helped them so much uh, through your podcast, through your courses, mm-hmm. through the art of leadership academy and i just beam when i hear that because i'm like what no better guy for people to be talking positively about uh behind your back and so and i know it happens all over the place so uh you know appreciate you letting me be on today i so appreciate you rich thanks for your friendship and uh thanks for everything you teach me and uh, we'll do this again soon thanks brother mm-hmm.